Hello and welcome to today's AWCI Media Online Learning Series program, Gen Z Managing the Cultural and Communication Gaps Between Generations, sponsored by SEMCO. I am Anne-Marie Salvatelli, AWCI's Director of Education and Foundation Programs. I'll be your host for today's presentation. I am joined by Chris Williams, AWCI's Director of Membership Development and Engagement, who will moderate today's chat. Good day to everyone and thank you for joining us. On your screen here, you'll see our first poll question of the day. To help us determine how many are in our audience, we'd like to know how many people are viewing today's webinar with you today. Please click on your selection on your screen to submit. We'll have more questions throughout today's broadcast, so be on the lookout. Amory. Before we start, uh, we have a few housekeeping items. All attendees should be on mute during today's presentation. However, we ask that you please mute your phones or computer microphones as well to ensure that we keep the line clear for our presenters. Should you have a question at any time during today's broadcast, please submit, um, submit it by using the question box on your GoToMeeting dashboard. We'll have a brief Q&A at the end of our presentation and we'll make every attempt to get all of your questions answered. If you have any audio or visual issues during today's presentation, please don't hesitate to let us know using the chat function in the dashboard or by emailing chris at cwilliams at awci.org. We'll attempt to resolve any issues that may arise as quickly as possible. Today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AWCI Media YouTube channel, and uh, that address is on your screen. All attendees will receive a link to this and all other AWCI recordings about an hour after the program, which will include a link to our brief follow-up survey. Today's PowerPoint slides may be downloaded by clicking the handouts area linked um, in your dashboard. And today's AWCI Media Online Series program is sponsored by SEMCO, an AWCI Lifetime member. With us today to say a few words is Steve Farkas, SEMCO's Director of Business Development. Steve. Good morning and welcome to everybody uh, to today's AWCI uh, on learning series webinar on managing Gen Z. Uh, as Anne-Marie had said, my name is Steve Farkas, Director of Business Development for SEMCO, and it is our pleasure to be a sponsor of today's webinar. SEMCO is the nation's premier manufacturer of cold form steel framing, metal lath and accessories, as well as some of the most innovative products and systems used in the construction industry, such as ProX header, Sureboard for Shear, Hot Rod and Hot Rod XL for head of wall applications. SEMCO is headquartered in City of Industry, California, located just east of Los Angeles. We are a family owned business having four manufacturing facilities strategically located across the Western United States, including Denver, Colorado, Fort Worth, Texas, City of Industry, California, and Pittsburgh, California. We hope that today's webinar will provide some insight on the importance of developing management skills for your employees and business partners that make up the Generation Z population. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, and thank you to SEMCO for their generous support of today's program. There are now five distinct generations at work in the construction industry, the silent generation, baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, and increasingly Gen Z. Job sites and offices see daily interaction between the generations, yet the form and tone that these inter interactions take is different and can become at times a source of unintended friction. Today's program, led by Dr. Amy Chastine Miller, Professor of Sociology and Vice Provost at the University of Southern Mississippi, will explore the unique characteristics of each generation, especially Gen Z, and address the common generational divergences that can occur in a workplace and how we can help bridge uh, the generational gap. And with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Miller. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you for the afternoon uh, webinar as part of the On Learning series. Um, I'm happy that all of you could take a few minutes to join me and to talk a little bit about Generation Z and just more broadly, the issue of the challenges we face with multi-generational workplaces. 
Um, as she said, my name is Amy Chastain Miller and I do work here at the University of Southern Mississippi where I've served as a professor of sociology for 22 years. And I also am an administrator I'm working in the office of the provost where I oversee a lot of initiatives with faculty um, as well as undergraduate students. And in that role, I've had the opportunity to watch as we've seen as you have in your businesses, new generations of students and employees come in and begin to work in a multi-generational environment. In addition to my work here at the university, I also do a fair amount of public speaking, consulting, and, and training around different aspects of management related to all of the changes regarding uh, generational issues, but also other forms of diversity that we see in the workplace. And, trying to adapt to the many, many social changes that we face in the world today. So if you're interested, um, certainly reach out to me, but also just find me on LinkedIn if that's something um, where you are and please keep up. Um, I'm always happy to hear from people and to stay in touch for those, with those people who are interested in the same topics that I am. This is a huge topic. If you spend any time flipping through magazines or following any um, industry publications or just surfing around on the internet, you will see that Generational differences are a hot topic right now. Um, it is something that everyone is talking about and how we can connect with the youngest generation that we typically now call Generation Z. And that gap between us when it comes to communication is often the one that we talk about the most often. And what I'm gonna do today is just really touch on some of the most significant themes in that literature or in the research that we see when we talk about generational differences and the youngest ones that are now entering the workforce. But I have to show this slide to remind everyone that it is really truly just the tip of that proverbial iceberg, that there's an enormous amount of research out there on any of the, the single topics or single points that I'll bring up today. And if you're interested, I'm gonna conclude by pointing to some references that you might wanna dig in deeper. And there's certainly a lot out there on the internet and elsewhere where you can read more, do more research independently to find out about what we know about all the different generations and, and ways we can try to connect them in the workplace and in our families and everywhere else, because it is a really interesting time um, to, to work um, and to try to see how we can connect people who are coming from often very, very different places. What are these generations that we see at work? Um, if you've read the latest issue uh, from AWCI of the Construction Dimensions magazine, you saw this lovely graphic, which I thought I'd include in the presentation. I thought it was a really nice representation. So you could see really neatly and clearly the five primary generations we see in today's workforce. Generation Z, um, I, there are a lot of different ways you can cut the years and say where one generation stops and where one starts. I like the years that they've chosen, 1997 to 2012 is a birth year. So these are our youngest generations that we see at school and work, up through the millennials, which we've been talking about now for some time. Those are our employees who are up into their mid thirties now. Generation X, the middle-aged folks, where I and many of you listeners likely are, into the boomers and up into the silent generation. And uh, here's a quick poll for you. See how many of you can answer this question. What percentage of the total US population is currently defined to be Generation Z? 10%, 15%, 20%, or 25%? So you can select which of those responses you think is, is an accurate indication by the, by the dates listed here. So if you look at this workplace, you know there, there's several different things you can notice, or these generations rather, um, you all probably work with people spreading across all of these, and and you can you can slice it as I said in different ways. You know, another way to think about it is um, this graphic, which is from the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, and this one represents it in a slightly different way. And especially as you get further away to look at millennials and Gen Z, the age ranges are slightly different in terms of the birth years, but one thing I like about this one is that it gives you a little bit of a gray area where there's some overlap in the generations. So a lot of people are kind of on the cusp between one generation and the next. So if you were born in 1970, you're pretty solidly generation X. But what if you were born in 1964? Are you generation X? Are you a baby boomer? Are you kind of somewhere in between? 
And I think it's it's a good way to think about it. There's not a clear cut year where all of a sudden everyone who was born that year is completely different than everyone born the preceding year. It's more like the generations kind of blur from one to the next. So over time and in, in retrospect, it becomes easier to kind of define where one generation starts and another one um, ended. But when we're in the midst of it, as we are now looking at millennials and Gen Z, those years tend to move around a good bit because we really haven't decided and history will ultimately tell us, I think, when we want to cut those dates. So don't get too, too stuck on when the years are. A lot of times people want to have fixed years, but ultimately we know that there, that there are significant differences and there are generations, but the years themselves aren't too terribly important. They're, they are a bit fuzzy. I think it's important though to recognize that there are generations in the workplace that do matter and that are different in some ways from prior years and they're different in a couple of ways that I think this graphic this graph make very makes very clear one is that compared to even as recently as 1994 you can see first of all more generations in the workplace it used to be for most of American history we would have two three maybe generations in the workplace you know, now it's very common to have four or five generations in the workplace. And when you introduce more generations, you just simply introduce more diversity and more potential for conflict and more potential for misunderstandings and complexities at work. And that's something we have to pay attention to. Another thing that's clear in this graph is that millennials have sur surpassed others as the, the largest percentage in the workforce and that that's happened relatively recently. So I think those are really important factors to notice and to think about as we think about the current and future workplaces in which we're going to be working. So what is a generation? I've been using that term pretty loosely for a few minutes now, but I haven't actually told you what it is. And if you Google it or look it up in a dictionary, you're gonna see different definitions. Sometimes historically, I think we've thought about a generation as literally the amount of time from one parenting group to the next offspring group. So we've thought about it as about 20, 25 years, but in recent years, we've shortened the amount of time for a group that we call a generation. And I think that's because we've come to think it less about, to be less about reproduction from one group to the next, and more about a group of people being influenced by similar circumstances. So the definition that I personally am most comfortable with is more like this, a cohort of people who were born roughly around the same time period. And as a result of that, they're being influenced by similar things. And you can tell here, of course, that I am a sociologist. So I'm public about that bias, that this is where I'm coming from and how I see the world. But if you are born roughly around the same time period, you're going to have experiences that are conditioned by a similar milieu. So for instance, many of you either were born and around the time of the depression or you have a relative who was, and it doesn't matter if you are from Kansas or Mississippi or New York, those people will have certain things in common. You know, perhaps they wash out their Ziploc bags and reuse them, or perhaps they never throw anything away. Um, and it doesn't really matter where they're from or many other differences among them by, by race or other things, they, they will share some things in common because they came of age in a particular economic moment. And that's just one brief example, but there are certain defining moments that happen for people who are born in the same era. And they can be cultural events, technological events, economic events, political events, but that context in the formative times of someone's life under the age of 20 does shape the way people approach the life that they live. It, it shapes the choices that they have and it shapes things about who they are as people. So for instance, if you have a group of people who are born in 1900, they're not going to be likely to um, choose careers that are shaped by the high-tech industry and they're not thinking about things like cloud computing or going to college because it's just not simply an option for them. And similarly today we don't have many people coming to college thinking about becoming farmers um, at the same rate that they were before. So it's just a different world. Um, so that's kind of how I think about generation is it's more, more about a shared formative life experience because of the cultural milieu and less about 
the age and the time span that's passed. And as things get more and more rapid in the world in terms of how quickly things change, I think generational time frames are getting shorter. And as a result of that, we may see that Generation X to Millennials to Gen Z is a shorter and shorter time frame because they become fundamentally different in some ways more quickly than there was a time frame between, say, the silent generation and the boomers. So if we think about it in this way, in terms of the social context really shaping people, and we really want to understand Generation Z and what they bring to work and how we are going to create an environment where we can work with them and, and create a productive workspace, we have to understand you know, what are some of the features of the social world that they grew up in, because ultimately that is what made them who they are and helped to condition them to behave in certain ways or to expect certain things or to contribute in certain ways or not to the workplace. So if we think about the world that, that this youngest generation, that produced this youngest generation, I think we have to start by thinking about the technology revolution because for both the millennials and the Gen Z, so essentially anybody under the age of about 30 to 35, this is the most important dynamic of the political, social, cultural milieu to influence who they are and how they operate in the world. This graph, I think, is the most powerful one I've seen to illustrate what's transformed all of our lives in the past 30 years. And this shows the internet users by world region and it begins in the year of 1995 and for those of us who are not Gen Z or Millennial that doesn't seem so long ago. Um, I came here as a faculty member in 1997 and when I first began teaching it was 1991 and of course in my industry of education you know that was a chalk and um, blackboard era and it's certainly very different now but I began teaching by asking people how many of you have an email address and very few did. And of course, that seems like ridiculous uh, by today, but it was a very short time ago. So in 1995, the number of people worldwide who used the internet was negligible. And in a very, very short time frame, it's ubiquitous. And that's a very, very rapid pace of change. And the, the generations we see today of millennials and certainly Gen Z, Gen Z was born post Google, post Amazon, they live in a world in which Google and Amazon are to them what the light switch or running water were to Gen Xers. And when, once that becomes part of the way we think about their life, I think it affects the way we understand how they operate. It's important to recognize that everybody older than that is a what we would consider a digital immigrant, that we learned to use technology and adapted to it and began to do the things we'd always done differently using technology. They have always done things with technology and there's a very fundamental difference in growing up in a world that's technology saturated and always having Google and so on than it is to immigrate to that when you grew up in your formative years with something very different. So we have to ask ourselves, how does it affect the youngest generations to grow up post-technology revolution? And I think it affects people in many ways. One is that this generation has grown up in a very small world. The world has gotten smaller and smaller over the past hundred years. And that's happened in many ways through technology primarily. It's literally smaller in the sense that you can get places very quickly now when it used to be very difficult to travel globally, now it's not. It's also smaller in the sense of communication globally is very easy. Um, you may have children or grandchildren who play video games, and if so, they may be playing with, you know, Fortnite with someone from Sweden when they get online at night. They, they know people all over the world, share music all over the world, and they are aware of events all over the world. Um, it is not uncommon for me to be somewhere and have an event that happened on the other side of the planet, planet pop up on my Apple Watch while I'm speaking. It's just an awareness and knowing about everything globally at, a, at an instant basis that makes the world seem very, very small. And I recall talking to my, my great grandmother and I'm, I'm 50 years old. And so my great grandmother was born in the 19th century and asking her about what her life was like as a child. And she was only aware of a very small radius in rural Alabama where she could walk to or ride a horse and buggy to. And she 
courted, as she put it, to people she could walk to and courted in a horse and buggy. And that is a long way from match.com or any of the ways in which people might meet someone today. It's just a very, very much larger world. And that definitely affects how people see themselves and see their, their lives. The youngest generation has also always had a continuous information stream around them. Um, many of us remember days before CNN and before all of this 24 hour news and it is something that I think many of us forget what it was like before. But if you take a moment and you reflect and you think about what it was like not to always have things coming at you, it felt very different. Um, and I put information in quotes for reasons that many of you could guess, right? It's, it's not always great information that we receive in the sense of being factual or accurate and Many of us have had to learn to filter what we receive and, and make judgments. And I know that when I personally first heard of CNN and saw it when it came out, I thought it was kind of ridiculous, which is why I'm not in the news industry, I suppose. But I just thought no one would really want to see that all day long. And I was obviously quite mistaken and it has been very successful. And this generation has always had constant information, more than they can manage coming at them all day, every day. And many of us feel that we have too much information. Nobody wants more email or more things, but it's something we remember before. And it's something that they have had since they were very small. And I think that we underestimate sometimes the impact that that has on growing up and in your formative years, that inundation of information. I think it's a fluid society that this generation grew up in and that that can be very stressful that things change very rapidly today and that it's a very stressful environment when that's the case. There is a lot of pressure on the youngest generations today and this is my social psychology background coming through, but many of us can think back, I'm sure, to middle school and adolescence more generally and the pressure to develop your sense of who you are as a person and to define your identity and that is a very painful process. And the fear of embarrassment and the fear of not being liked or not being who you want to be when you are young is intense. And we all, prior to the era of Google and whatnot, Facebook and other social media, we had the privilege of doing that relatively privately and, and locally. But now is a, there's a great deal of pressure to craft a self that you put out there publicly from the time you were very young. And I think that creates for this generation a lot of pressure for identifying a successful version of yourself to put out there in the world. And that has created a lot of issues with identity development, with a sense of independent self, and with a sense of confidence in this, this generation. So that is something that we've, we see a lot of research emerging on around this generation and the impact of social media on identity development is something that social psychologists are really starting to get into. This generation is more exposed to diversity than any prior generation, in part because of that globalization that they've been part of and the, the global perspective that they have. This generation on any, any survey or study that you look at the millennials and then even more so Gen Z have a higher level of comfort with diversity of all forms than any other generation. So this is where you see some real generation gaps in the workplace and elsewhere is that on any study of racial diversity around gender and sexuality or on any other measure of, of difference, this generation has a very open mindset about differences among people and expect people to be different because they've seen that looking on the internet and everywhere else that they've, they've lived, so to speak. This generation has also been taught to ask questions and voice their opinion in ways that prior generations have not. Children for many generations were not encouraged to talk to their parents or other adults about what they thought or to ask why about things and to articulate what they wanted to do and to be given equal voice in the household to a very large extent, but that has definitely been kind of part of the parenting culture, what we would consider to be intensive parenting culture of the past generation or two. 
and that makes a difference in how they approach work and how they approach higher education as well that they come with an an expectation that they will be allowed or expected to ask questions and that their opinion is equally valid or valued and that has to do with, with the entire way that their upbringing has been on average not that every person has been raised that way but it's it's definitely part of the the cultural milieu and Finally, I would say this generation very much has lacked a form of mentorship that existed in prior years. There's been a decrease in a lot of participation in traditional civic organizations that were multi-generational. So many of these young people have not had the opportunity to learn from non-relatives who were mentors to them, who could teach them about how to be professional, how to learn skills. And so a lot of these students and young people going to work really still need a lot of growth opportunities that the workplace can provide. And you have another poll question in front of you. As these young people, Generation Z, enter into the workforce, what is the most important management characteristic that they are seeking? And according to a recent study published by Inc. Magazine, are they looking for scheduling flexibility? autonomy and creative freedom, supportive leadership, or comfortable workspaces, which is the most important characteristic that they've identified? So I've shared with you a little bit about the cultural milieu that, that raised this generation, so to speak. And we're talking there as a, as a sociologist, I'm speaking about patterns broadly, and there are always exceptions. You know, everybody um, does not come out like the, the typical person of the generation, but on average, those are the typical, those are the milieu factors that this generation has seen. So the typical characteristics we see is that are that one, uh, this generation is very, very intertwined with technology. It has been part and parcel of them. You know, I, I tend to call them cyborgs or half human, half machine. They walk around with a phone in the hand and it doesn't ever leave. They sleep with it, they walk around with it. Um, they wanna have a waterproof case so they can shower with it. They just never put it down. But they are not broadly tech literate. They, we tend to make uh, the false assumption that because they are so intertwined with technology that they know how to use it and how to differentiate between good and bad websites and things like that, but they do not and they are not. They just know how to do what they know how to do, which is certain forms of social media, Snapchat, listen to music. They're good at those things, but they are not good universally at navigating the internet or finding quality information. And there's a lot of research to show that. Um, funny story, I my mom who is 75 and myself and my daughter who is 18 went out shopping and my daughter, as we're getting out of the car, of course, grabs her phone, and my mother says to her, you can't just go in the mall with your phone in your hand like that. You're going to forget and put it down somewhere and lose it. And my daughter burst out laughing because that, that is about as likely as her putting her arm down somewhere and forgetting it. But my mother, being 75, would put her phone down and, and leave it somewhere. So it's just very generationally revealing, those, those comments, because I might, but probably not. My daughter is absolutely not possible that she would leave her phone somewhere. So it's just definitely part of this generation that they are intertwined with their technology, not only physically in that sense, but also it's part of their identity. They post things on social media to get likes, and if they don't get enough likes, they take them down. They plan events in order to get pictures. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole topic in itself, but it's very much a part of who they are. They're very skeptical of traditional institutions and authority structures, and I think this is tied to that um overload of information and media and the information being in quotes that they too are skeptical of the validity of the information they're getting so ultimately they end up doubting everything they read and everything they see and whether it's true or not and they start to question everybody's intentions and they have the lowest level of faith in political structures they doubt traditional even religious structures they're more likely to check none about religious affiliation than any other generation millennials and gen z so they'll say they're religious but they're not affiliated with any religion because they they doubt that they don't trust the traditional structures as much and this tends to spill over a bit into the workplace too where they wonder about why are we doing things the way we already always have? Tradition, authority, all of that breeds a little bit of skepticism. 
They always want to know the why of work. They want to be involved in decisions. They want to understand why things are happening the way they are. This is true not only at work, but this is true in higher education. I can tell you if, if you assign an assignment to a Gen Z student or millennial for that matter, they want to know why. Um, it's not good enough to say you need to write a paper. They want to know why should they write a paper. They don't accept that just because they should. They expect any ideas and input they have to be valued. Um, opinions are expected to be important um, and equally so almost or valued by others regardless of generation. And this is something that is definitely different among this generation compared to prior generations like Gen X or boomers. There was not an anticipation that older generations would value their input or opinions until they had paid their dues. This generation does not see it that way. They strongly value personal achievement and they do strongly value hard work. They are willing to work hard, especially if they know the reason and the why behind it. Um, they, on surveys, for instance, will indicate that financial independence is more important to them than marriage. They want to be independent, they want to be able to take care of themselves, and they want to achieve their goals, and they're willing to work hard for it. Um, compared to millennials, Gen Z tend to be more independent and less interested in, in a team, less interested in, for instance, the, the foosball table in the, in the room at the workplace and more interested in, in getting that work done. Um, but they, they are motivated by things they are passionate about and not just doing things because they've been assigned to them. They are very connected to family and they communicate with their parents and other family members regularly. And this is where you can see the family values tying them more to boomers than to their own parents, their Gen X parents, because they will, for instance, be interested in relocating or staying in a job because of family connections. They'll consider family and refer, talk with family about decisions that they made. But the connection to family is, is in a level that's very different from prior generations and that they may bring family into job interviews, I've heard of this. They certainly bring them into the higher ed environment, but there is a, a continual conversation with parents about things that many of us in prior generations would not have ever thought of having conversations with parents about. They do tend towards anxiety and quick frustration. Uh, there's a lot of conversations about mental health with millennials and even more so with Generation Z. If you look at studies of anxiety disorders and anxiety more generally, the percentage of people reporting that symptoms that meet the criteria for anxiety disorders, it goes up as you go down in the generations. So millennials are higher than Gen X, Gen Z are reporting higher levels of anxiety disorders than millennials. So the higher anxiety levels are associated with the younger generations and depression as well. So these are issues around mental health and mental well-being that can be dramatic um, and they, they can be significant enough to interfere with work or interfere with people's ability to, to be successful. So this leads to some common generational divergences, as you might imagine. I've, as I've hinted at, there are often very big differences between the generations and how they get work done and how they communicate. That is the number one difference we see because many of us, we live in our own world and we live in our own generation, obviously. So we have our way of doing things that works for us. And then when we suddenly find ourselves working with people who come from different cultures, so to speak, generational cultures, we find it difficult to, to get things accomplished. And we try to communicate in a way we find to be professional in tools that we find to be useful and others aren't responding or they aren't responding in ways that seem appropriate. Attitudes towards work and life relationships can be very different. The traditional boomer way was to come to work nine to five or eight to five, work is over, and then you do your social life and the two do not meet. Um, for the youngest generations, they don't really think about work-life balance as much as work-life integration or work-life alignment. They want their work to be things that they see is aligned with their life values. And you may work a little, do a little of your life, then work some more at night, and it's all a little bit mixed together in ways that are, that are very different from older generations. They also value different things and how you prioritize it. 
may be different from other generations. Attitudes towards authority and hierarchy. Uh, younger generations, millennials and Gen Z both, don't necessarily think that just because someone is higher up in the hierarchy or has official authority that their opinion should be valued more, to be blunt. And that's something that can cause a lot of rifts at work, um, can cause conflicts. And we see that in higher education as well. You know, students may believe that their opinions or their attitudes should be valued as much as a professor or that an administrator's opinion shouldn't be more valued than theirs. And so we struggle with, I struggle with listening to students and thinking, well, just because it's the student's opinion doesn't mean it's not a good idea. So we have to find that balance between listening and also recognizing the value of experience. Responding to feedback and criticism, tying it in with a comment I made a minute ago about the high levels of anxiety, depression, things like that. Um, oftentimes, feedback and criticism can be taken very personally by the younger generations, in part because the way in which traditional K through 12 education, mainstream K through 12 education is set up now, a lot of times students have not had a lot of critical feedback, either through the schooling or through extracurricular activities. They haven't had a lot of opportunities to fail or to figure things out on their own. So many of us who grew up playing unsupervised with other children on our own and getting into arguments and having to sort it out, that doesn't happen often anymore as there are typically not cases of unsupervised play without an adult present and the adults often sort out things for the children. By the time they grow up, they really don't have a lot of experience responding to feedback and criticism and that can be difficult in the workplace for them to, to be mentored into understanding that. There's a high level of comfort with diversity and change in the younger generations, and it's less so as you move up the generation, so that's a, a common divergence. And then boundaries. Often the younger generations say things about their personal life or private matters at work that other generations think um, are inappropriate. And um, other, the younger generations find the older generations to be insufficiently sharing um, and not connecting, so there, there can be many di divergences there. So how can you bridge these? I'll give you a few quick tips on some strategies that I and others have found effective at trying to connect people across the generations to build a productive workplace environment. First, I think it's important to recognize that there are differences. A lot of times people talk about diversity at work, but they don't talk about generational diversity. And these are things that exist and talking about them and trying to create some empathy around them can make a big difference because people really don't know that much about others' life experiences. So sometimes just doing activities together in the workplace can get people talking casually, but you can also have more structured situations where people have conversations about what, what, what happened in their formative years. What were some of the big political events and how did that affect them? For millennials, it was 9-11. And 9-11 is something that most people who are at work will remember and they can talk about how that affected them. And that could be something that can help people gain insight and empathy into other people. So having something people read together or talk about or have a speaker that people react to, some way to gain insight into others' experiences can help recognize the differences and bridge that gap a little bit to start that process. Second, in addition to recognizing and addressing the differences, you can invest in really building a, a shared multi-generational workplace culture. And that's important to not just have a culture that you expect new generations to fit into, but to start trying to reshape the culture of the workplace so that it's truly multi-generational. And this can mean a really substantive onboarding process, uh, an, uh, an orientation, so to speak, that's, that's pretty meaty. And then being very explicit about expectations and policies. A lot of times we think that people will just use common sense, so to speak, to know things like what they should wear to work or how they should answer a phone. And it's not necessarily common sense for every generation to know what is expected. So sometimes we really have to think carefully about what our workplace culture should be and how it can be shared. And that can be a really productive conversation 
um, especially if you have a facilitated conversation with leaders that are a multi-generational group to talk about what kind of a workplace culture would be most productive and talking about you know what kinds of changes in the workplace culture would help everyone are there changes that can be made that would be supportive of all third I think it's important to commit to communicating in different modalities and not just communicating one way. Yes, sometimes it's important to have meetings. I have to throw in an office slide here. We hope they're not like that, but you need to have meetings sometimes face-to-face. -face. And the youngest generation, Generation Z, actually prefers this. They like to have face-to-face -face meetings um, about things that matter, not meetings just to have meetings, and not meetings about things that could have been done via email. But a meeting to talk about things is important because that way you can have everybody's input and have discussions. But sometimes emails are a good way to get out large amounts of information to everyone at the same time. So it looks, it's fair, everyone gets the information simultaneously without regard to position. It's quick and it's easy. Other times I think formal memos can be good for getting official policies posted and in writing. I think it's important to have company policies about social media and texting. I personally, my advice is that texting is only good for emergencies, for really urgent matters that need attention to say, I need you to get here now to a meeting, or I need you to look at an email I just sent right away, but not for anything lengthy or anything that really needs discussion. And I think the phone is underutilized. I'm a believer in phone calls to quickly resolve issues rather than email and phone calls to talk about things that are confidential. Um, so the phone, all of these modes of communication are useful for different things. And Dr. Miller, if yes. I may interrupt for a second, I have a quick question relating yeah. to uh, the phone side of it. I, I read an article a few weeks ago that addressed that increasingly it appears that Gen Zers would rather have telephone calls versus text messages and emails in the work setting. Have, have you seen that? Have you heard of that? And if so, it, would you care to posit any reasons that, that might be? I haven't seen any data on that, but I would not be shocked to hear that. Um, I think in general, the youngest generations do not like to talk on the phone They with their friends or anything like that. They prefer FaceTiming. Um, that's the typical mode or texting. But I wouldn't be surprised to hear that in the workplace, they would like a phone call um, just I think it goes along with the lines that they prefer meetings to emails or to texting because they don't, I mean, frankly, they don't like to read. Um, <laughs> I think they'd rather hear someone's voice and go through that um, personal kind of connection rather than sit down and read a long email. That's probably the least favorite if I had to bet. That would be Thank my you. bet. But I haven't seen any data on it yet. So, in addition to the three I've mentioned before, the differences, building shared culture, communicating in different modalities, there's a lot of uh, information out there now of people successfully using multi-generational teams and mentorship models as a way to help bridge gaps. And this, I think, can be done successfully and strategically. You just have to look at your own company culture and think through what would work or not for you. But for instance, if you have young folks who are really great at certain technologies that you have and they can partner with someone who could be a mentor to them in other ways and share their technology knowledge, that can work as sort of a dual two-way mentoring. Um, sometimes that works great. And so you have to kind of think through it, but multi-generational teams to accomplish a common goal can be a great way for people to get to know each other past the, the, the obvious kind of stereotypical images they may have. And that can be a very successful way to to bridge those gaps. I think it's also very important to address conflicts as soon as they occur, or ideally even before they occur. I, I think it doesn't take a sociologist to say, well, if we have five generations and people are coming from, you know, they're different gender, different race and ethnic backgrounds, and you have all of these differences among people and you put them in a group together, you're going to have conflicts and you're going to have hurt feelings and you're going to have, you know, all sorts of risk and problems if you see that coming, the more you do on the front end to help people work through differences and talk about potential challenges, the fewer problems you're going to have at work on the back end. So I think addressing those conflicts rather than avoiding them or waiting for them to worsen is always the best method. So anything proactive that, that we can do to talk about conflict, I think is always a great idea. And having people address it 
can be very, very helpful. Even if it's un uncomfortable for them in the beginning, there's a way, there are ways to do it that are more fun than not. And I think it's important that we think about this now because we are on the cusp of having really the Generation X and Millennials dominating the work, every workplace, because Millennials are the majority, but they are the largest fraction now, but pretty soon the Millennials plus Gen Xers are going to be the majority of the workforce and Millennials plus Gen Zers are dominating, are also the majority when they'll be over 50% by 2025. So when you think about that, you know, I think it's all the more important that those of us who are above the millennial bracket or older millennials and up start thinking strategically about what kind of a workforce of the future we really want to have and how we can work with those now who are coming up in a mentorship capacity to create a, a multi-generational workplace that really embodies the, the values and the practices that we think will be most productive and work best for all of us. So I know I know that's a very, very quick overview. Here, here are some references for you. And um, this is of course downloadable. So you'll have these if you want um, to see them and look any of them up for yourself. But there's, there's a ton of research out there. The Pew Research Center, PWP, they have great website information you can download just to look at data and surveys they've done that are fascinating that can help you just dig a little bit more into the generational differences that we see at work and, and at home and in families and, and other institutions. So thank you very much for your time and I very much appreciate it and I hope you found a sociological perspective on these issues to be interesting. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And as a reminder, if you have any questions about today's presentation, please submit them via the question box on your dashboard and we'll circle back uh, to answer those questions. I do have a couple, Dr. Miller. Uh, first one uh, goes back a, a few slides here. How, how do we address the disconnect and how leaders from the baby boomer generation and to some extent Gen X interpret how the Gen Z and millennials view leadership? You, you talked a little bit about um, the, that's, I don't wanna say adversarial, viewpoint, but, but asking why and not necessarily taking, you have to do this as a reason to question in terms of what they've been assigned in the workplace. How do we address that as Gen Xers and as baby boomers? So when you say how they view leadership, you mean how they view particular, like how they view people in leadership? Correct. Um, yes, I think a lot of times my experience has been that they genuinely are unaware that what they are saying is being interpreted as disrespectful or as as they're just not thinking about the possibility that they are cutting off their opportunities to learn from someone with a lot more experience frankly so my take on it is keeping in mind that this youngest generation has a tendency to be a bit fragile and to react emotionally or to feel attacked I usually say to them, you know, I am glad that you are so eager and that you want to learn and I want you to be successful. I believe that you have a lot of potential. And because I want you to be successful, I want to talk to you about something because I think that you could learn something here. And I sort of start with that, um, that kind of a tone of I want them to be successful. And then I talk to them about the need to understand the importance of experience and how people being in a role for a very long time and kind of share with them a little bit about my story of you know the time invested in the things I've learned along the way and I ask them to talk to other people about their story of how they got into that position you know different people in different roles that I may know who'd be willing to speak with them and my experience has been that if they can just listen to that and get a sense of the fact that their assumptions may be off, that the, the, the people in leadership have experience that they need to learn from and that, they, that there's a path to get where they want to go, but they may not start as a vice president, that they need to take a breath and go back and humble themselves and go back a little bit. Um, that has worked very well. But I think the key thing to remember is that you have to start by meeting them where they are emotionally and saying, by the way, you know, you, you, I want you to be successful and I think you you have a lot of good qualities. And here's a thing that you need to learn that that tends to be the best way to do it. And you actually answered my second question about how we address and offer feedback and positive critiques and criticism to Gen Zers. 
I put the third poll question we had up here in terms of what the most desired uh, management characteristic from Gen Zers is. The majority of our audience responded with scheduling flexibility in the Inc. Magazine study. It was 23% won't take a job without supportive leadership and 55% would love to have it. That, that is the mm -hmm. correct answer. So I want, wanted to kind of circle back to that. A uh, question from the audience too, Dr. Miller. In respect to communicating okay. with and amongst Gen Z, do you think there may be a relationship between the perceived need for instant gratification and satisfaction of the response typically seen in social media communications and the desire to meet in person versus emails, texts, et cetera? Yes, probably. Because um, I think especially with emails, there's a delay. Um, and so people people do want instant responses to things. And I think having that can could definitely be part of the reason people want that. And I would expect also another thing we didn't talk about has to do with evaluations and performance feedback. And that's a big generational difference is that this youngest generation, they would like that to happen um, daily. And of course they would like it all to be positive too, but that's a whole other subject. Um, but they do like the idea of getting constant feedback on how they are doing and that can be exhausting and something you have to kind of talk with them about too is saying you know this you, you can't have this all the time whereas you know boomers once a year is fine so it's it's definitely a huge generational gap and the whole idea of continual feedback face to face on you're doing this well you're doing this well but helping them to understand how to kind of self police and self mentor and, and getting them into mentoring but not it being just about what's good, but learning how to grow a little bit as well. But I do think that instant feedback is is a is a challenge because you can't give everybody instant feedback all the time. Excellent. De definitely agree with you on that one. Uh, another question from the audience. Do you see a need for more coaching skills as opposed to traditional management skills for this generation? I see a preference for it for sure. And I think that's a challenge for us who work in, in roles that are managing because coaching is is hard. Um, it's very time consuming and I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I think a lot of people have gone to more peer mentoring models in part to, to try to address that because the youngest generations do like the idea of being coached. And a part of it is that feedback, that continual um, daily kind of support towards growth. And I don't know if we're going to evolve into something where current generations coming in are getting a coaching model that they in turn will coach younger people coming behind them. But that is the model that people prefer is that coaching rather than a more formal traditional management style. Um, it is hard though because it's very time consuming and we have other things to do. Um, so how you end up structuring it to make it possible, I don't know, but it is the preference of, of what they have. And, I think that the needs in terms of the mentoring of this generation are multiple um, because they, and it depends in part obviously on what they get in schooling and in apprenticeships or internships before they get to work. Um, but they do need to learn things like, for instance, the ability to set goals and the ability to organize their time and the ability to um, behave professionally in their interpersonal interactions and the extent to which you're going to have to coach them on those sorts of behaviors versus other sorts of larger issues just depends on the person and depends on what they come to the table with. Um, I, my personal view is that a lot of what we need to be doing in higher education is that we have to start gearing more and more towards those sorts of soft skills to ready students for work because that's more and more what they need to bring to the table when they exit where we are. And I'll ask a follow-up question uh, just based off of that, and it's a fairly drastic question. Do you think that with the, the data you cited that in 2025, uh, millennials and Gen Z will make up the majority of the workforce, that there needs to be a drastic rethink of how we as Gen Xers and baby boomers lead? Uh, in other words, it, do we need to have a complete overhaul in terms of our leadership styles to be able to adjust to that majority in 2025? I think it depends on what outcome we want. Um, I think we're kind of being forced into it to some degree because I, what I hear is a lot of frustration from people trying to manage in the ways that they were managed. I don't think it's working that well for many people. And so I think if we don't adapt and adjust in our management styles, we may not get the outcomes we want. 
Um, so I guess it just kind of depends on what, what we want to do and what's working for us or not. I know that in higher education, we're having to adjust a lot of what we do to try to get better outcomes for what we want. Um, and I think in what I see at work is, is a similar thing. You know, it, it just depends on what you want. If you if we want 15 years from now to have certain kinds of people leading the workplace, I think we have to think about what kinds of leadership at work will get us that end. And if the traditional ways are just leading us to be frustrated, I think we have to start thinking about what kinds of alternative ways of leading would get us where we want to be. And if the students are graduating college and heading to work or graduating high school and heading to work and they're needing something different, then we have to figure out maybe restructured ways of leading that get us to that point. Okay. Well, we would like to thank Dr. Miller for joining us today and sharing her wealth of knowledge on how to bridge the generational divide in workplace and engage younger employees. We'd also like to thank SEMCO for their generous support of today's webinar. As a reminder, this program was recorded and you'll receive a link to AWCI's online program library, as well as a link to a brief post-event survey following the conclusion of today's broadcast. In addition, we also have some great resources available through the foundation of the wall and ceiling industry, which you may access uh, by visiting our website at awci.org foundation. Our next AWCI Media Online Learning Series program, Building a Culture of Safety from the Ground Up, will take place on Thursday, July 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Be on the lookout for an email with details on how to register next month. On behalf of the Association of the Wall and Ceiling Industry, thank you for joining us today and have a productive day.